everyone, and welcome to today's Oyster Stew podcast. As you consider starting your own investment advisor, how to transition your book of business is always a hot topic for discussion. In today's podcast, Oyster experts Buddy Doyle and Steven Anderson share their insights on broker protocol and other things to consider like employment agreements, commissions, and technology. Buddy, let's get started. Thanks, Libby. I'm joined with Steve Anderson today. Steve, welcome. Thanks, buddy, and Libby. Looking forward to the conversation. All right. Today, we're going to talk about transferring your book of business. Unless you're starting a new RIA and you don't have an existing book of business, in which case you can probably tune this one out. But for the rest of you, most of you, you're currently working with clients. And I would imagine as you start a new RIA, you're going to want to bring most of those clients, maybe all of those clients, maybe not with you. Steve, you've been doing this for a while. What have you seen folks do when they when they start transferring their book of business? Well, buddy, you know, one thing I think is a good thing to look at when you mentioned that one thing I thought of, it's also a good time to do a little bit of house cleaning. Because you probably got a few of those clients that you really don't want. I mean, even though they're either high maintenance, whatever the reason is, I found that this is a great time to just say, I'm going to leave 5% or 10 or whatever of those clients back at the old firm or just say, maybe you'd be better saying where you're at. So I think sometimes if you eliminate those 5 or 10, it's much easier to grow. Like a lot of times they're the people that take a lot of time and effort and don't give you a lot of revenue. So I think it's a good time to look at your book. It's hard to do that if you're at the same, if you're not changing firms. This just gives you an opportunity, gives the advisor an opportunity to say, I'm going to thin my uh, client tell out a little bit. I know we all try to build clients, but sometimes you have to take a step backwards to build a better client base. Yeah, pruning can be very important for future growth. So it is a good time to take a look at that. My experience is has been that most advisors, when they're starting a new RIA, do tend to find that most of their clients want to come with them. It's always a big fear. You know, you hear people worried, will my clients come with me or not? But if you've evaluated the way you run your business and you feel good about it, good enough to start your own RIA, you should probably feel good enough that the majority of those clients will come with you. You might lose a few. I've seen instances where, you know, reps have left a wire house, uh, maybe a big bank relationship is established with a client and they may choose to to stay because that's where their liabilities are in addition to their assets. And there can be certain benefits and, and features of that. But by and large, it seems like most advisors take a lot of their client base with them. Yeah, I would agree, buddy. I think I think a lot of what I see are the people that they want to take, they're typically well over 90% of those that come over. It's usually one or two surprises for whatever reason they don't come. But for the most part, that advisor that's successful, he or she has been taking care of those clients for years. And so they want they really are buying, even though sometimes the you know, the people sell, oh, it's the big name, you know, firm or whatever, but they're really buying that advisor. They're buying what he or she is telling them and helping them through the situation. So they're for the most part going to move to that new firm, unless there's, you know, they're not having all the products or something like that. For the most part, they're going to move with the advisor. Yeah. So there's a, there's a few other things to keep in mind, which isn't just what your clients are going to think about this, but Steve, you mentioned your existing firm and you may be forming an RIA where you're going to keep your assets, you know, held at the same firm that they're at now and you're you'll have your own entity, but maintain an independent relationship, maybe on the broker dealer side in in an independent firm. But there's uh, there's a lot to think through about where you're coming from to where you're going. And I wanted to mention the concept of the broker's protocol, uh, mm-hmm. which is, uh, if you go back in time, about 20 years ago, firms got together and, you know, it was a rep would leave, they'd go to another firm, 
the firm they were leaving would sue the new firm, put a temporary restraining order in place to try to prevent that rep from taking their their clients, which the firm deems its clients and the rep deems their clients. And so when you have two people kind of looking at it the same way, uh, often courts would get involved and decide sort of what needs to take place. And a lot of times it was the hiring firm, you know, settling with the, the firm that the rep left. And what happened is over time, firms got tired of suing each other. They realized they were all coming out pretty much even, right? We'll sue you and, and we'll settle for you for 30% and then you sue us and we settle with you for 30%. And everybody kept losing 30% or 50% or 70% plus attorney's fees, right? Yeah. And the the plus for the attorney's fees was great for the attorneys, but it was bad for everybody, right? In the industry, uh, it was just a, a sue each other over and over again. And so they established uh, in the larger firms uh, some some rules of the road. And originally, it was just the largest firms working this out because they had the largest expenses. Um, but obviously, this is a competitive industry. And so you can't have sort of non-competitive practices. So the broker's protocol got created. And what that does is it if your current firm that you're working for is on the protocol and the firm that you're going to is on the protocol and as an RIA you can join that protocol. Here's the rules. Somebody leaves, they have to resign. They're allowed to take essentially the holiday card list of client names and contact information. They're required to give us a spreadsheet of uh, you know before you leave of of what your client book looks like and and then there's some some things you can do and some things you can't do. Outside of that agreement that firms voluntarily participate in, there's Reg SP. There are certain thresholds that firms set around rating and recruiting and how much production you can take out of one branch. And so I think it's very important to understand what the broker's protocol is, what it is not, and if you're in the broker's protocol, I think the rules are, are pretty pretty straightforward. If you're not going to join the broker's protocol or the firm you're leaving is not, that's where you probably want to also reach out to your counsel and discuss what you can take, what you can't take, what your litigation risk might look like. And you'll want to have an experienced uh, attorney in that kind of area. Steve, have you run across any non-protocol firm activities and, and seen any practices that are that are good? And then I think we can talk about the ones that we know are not good. Yeah, no, I think we can definitely have done that. And even with the protocol, I think I think it's important, buddy, on when you're leaving a firm to make sure that you that you do cross all those T's and dot the I's. And what I mean by that is that make sure you read an agreement that you've got possibly an employment agreement with that old firm what does it say you can do and as you said i think you gave a good example if you think about the christmas card list that's really what they can take because it's really the name address email address phone number they can take an account name they can say this is my retirement account but they can't take the pot the number the account number so in my view when an advisor's starting their own ra or they're joining another firm it really is a good idea for them to cons consult counsel, make sure they know what they can do and make sure that some of them think, well, gee, I can be in there the, the month or the week before and download a whole bunch of things off my computer. Guess what? They can tell you everything you're doing on that computer all the time. So you don't want to set them up for a lawsuit that it's going to be, it's going to cost you money, time. And even if you're successful, a lawsuit's an irritant all the time and what i've seen from the uh, wide range from the independent broker dealers some simply have the case that's your account you can take everything with you if you leave you know everything that you've wrote in here you can take with you but again 
understand what the ground rules are. Not to the point that I would sit down with that president of the broker dealer or the, pre- the head of the RAA and say, I'm, I'm going to leave next Thursday. What sh- you know, tell me what I can do. I wouldn't do that, but I'd be very aware of what's going on, what the process is. I think that's the, the best thing. And to be prepared. Don't just say I'm going to retire or resign on uh, April 1st and not have everything lined up. So you pretty well need to know I'm going to go out there and reach out and contact those clients. Here's the list of clients I'm going to contact. Even if the firm says you can, you know, we're not going to restrict you or they're a protocol firm. Either way, make sure you're doing it the correct way. Yeah, and some of those traps that you kind of need to run through could include training. A lot of times when firms bring you in and they train you and they get you started, that's a large investment that they've made in you and they'd like to recover that. We see, hey, we had this existing banking relationship and we referred this client over to you to handle their investments. There's often strings attached to those. So I think it is important to look at your employment agreement, make sure you understand it. And I would say it's it's okay to be optimistic about your future, but don't look at those issues in your employment contract optimistically. You'll want to have your skeptic hat on when you're leaving, because that's usually when things get a little contentious. <laughs> I thought they were all your friends, but if you went in and you resign, they necessarily aren't all your friends. So it's important to be cautious. You know, one of the things people sometimes miss, buddy, and you'd think it's not that long of a thing, but it's a promissory note. You know, maybe they joined that firm or they renewed when there was a change in management or whatever at the firm, and they agreed to stay there for seven years or whatever. The firm's going to enforce whatever that promissory note says they're going to enforce. So again, do your homework. Make sure you're aware of what you've signed, what's there. You definitely can move. I don't want to say you can't move because you can. People move every day, but just do it carefully. Yeah, think about this. When you start your RIA, you're taking on this fiduciary duty. You have a duty to your clients to act in their best interest. You have to keep in mind the people running the organization that you're leading have a duty to their shareholders to act in their best interest. Absolutely. And so your your interests are not going to be aligned on this necessarily. And um you know, it's it, look at your firm's history. You can go out there and search the web and see if they've been engaging in litigation for, for reps that have left, what their issues are and points of view are. Now, that can be a pretty good indicator. And we've seen a lot of firms leaving the protocol as maybe their business style has has not been attracting as many reps as it's been losing. Firms take different tax to keep their assets, and they consider them to be their assets quite quite often. Whereas, again, independent rep firms, as Steve said, hey, that's your book of business. We're we're here to facilitate it. And, you know, even those, buddy, one of the things I think is an important thing to, to look at is to make sure that timing makes sense. And by that, I mean frequently and may or may not be in a contract, but a practice from a firm would be that if somebody leaves, they're going to hold commissions maybe for 60 days to see if there's any chargebacks. Now, they may not have done that when you were an active advisor there, but when you're no longer there, not unusual for them to hold commissions for 60 days. So you want to plan for that and make sure you've got some plans in place to say, hey, I want to make sure I've got my my budget in order that I can stand not having that other commission. But what you also time is maybe you've got today a lot of trail commissions from a certain 12B1s from a certain fee, uh, fund or mutual fund family. Well, don't move right about the time those are going to get paid. Think about that. Think of, make, make sure that that move date makes sense for you. You're never going to cover everything, but just think about those things of when I'm going to move. Yeah, have a plan. Have Absolutely. a plan. Be prepared. Because the other thing you're going to want to do is get those assets transferred as quickly as you can when Correct. you're when you're in your new firm. And there is a process to, to transfer those assets. It does take a little while. You're going to have to fill out some paperwork with your clients and have them 
sign off on that for that process to get started. And of course, you won't be earning anything until those assets are over there. So that's something to just be prepared for and to think through. But once you're once you're moving, you want to move very deliberately, very quickly, and prioritize your client book to make sure that you're makes you're sense. doing this in the order you want to go in. Yeah, now, that that makes a lot of sense to prioritize. You know, get those most important people. You know, the, here's the top twenty. I want to make sure I call them right away and talk about it. One thing that's helped people transition from one firm to the other has been technology. There's a lot of firms that now specialize to take all those multitude of firm forms you need to get done and make it simpler. You know, they've got some names and things they can take it off of a CRM or wherever you've got that Christmas card list from your, as you said, buddy, take that list, be able to pre-populate a lot of forms where at one time they had to do that by hand. Today, technology gives them a lot of heads up to do that quicker and faster. Yeah. And I think the other risk, and I I'm kind of remember the old proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. <laughs> is If you are resigning as part of a team, you're leaving and you're planning on bringing some other advisors with you to your new organization, you definitely want to make sure you understand rating and recruiting practices and where those risks fall, and that's a really good time to talk to a a litigator on your behalf to make sure you don't cross any lines and end up getting sued and and likely having a paid a settlement uh, with your with your firm. Well, I think we can balance things out, but at first we talked about the protocol of saying that it was sort of the attorney's full employment act, which you know prior to that it was. But now we're also saying, here's a way to go talk to the attorneys, because you really, this is not where you want to save money is by not talking to that good securities attorney who has helped other advisors transition. It's well worth the cost to sit down with them, have them give you a game plan to how this is going to work. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If you want to get advice, you should go to the experts and... You know, some of us are in the expert business. Uh, Some of us manage portfolios for our clients and give them plans and advice for a fee. Attorneys give advice for a fee around leaving one firm and going to another. And clients learn from you about risk and how to manage that risk. You'll learn the same thing from them. So it's, it's very important. Treat Treat your business like you would any investment in your portfolio. Manage that risk and and you should be okay. But work your plan. Make sure that you, as you said, buddy, you got to have a plan. So get a plan, get a date that makes sense for a lot of things, and then transition. Because it does work. You people every day are transitioning, going to a new firm. The key is, is you want to go to the new firm, take as many, not all, my my opinion, not everybody, but you want to take as many of those clients as you can to the new firm and do it as quickly as you can. This is the speed. Speed definitely helps here. Yeah. Client signing parties can be kind of interesting. <laughs> I've seen folks do those and that works well. Just having that sort of process and, and lining it up to how your culture of your organization exist is is going to be good. There's as many ways to do this as times it's been done. Correct. And talk to the new firm that you're joining. They often, you know, obviously they've done this several times. They can help you and tell you best practices, tell you what worked before, hasn't worked. You want that firm that's going to try something new. That's a good deal. I, I, never, I, I never, even if it worked before, I want to see if there's a better way. Let's break it and do something better next time. But that's a good experience for you. You haven't done it before. That firm has that you're joining. Have them help you. Have them give them that plan. I will say if you're joining an organization that says, just bring those records, it doesn't matter. (laughs) We'll pre-fill your agreements for you before you resign and have those all ready to go. Again, talk to an attorney about that. That may not be a firm you want to join. I will encourage you to to think through this. And 
If you have any questions along the way, you can always reach out to those of us over here at Oyster, and we'd be happy to let you talk to some clients that have done this before. Don't forget, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have, have gone down this path already and survived. Ask them what their experience was like, and, and they'll share it. Absolutely. I had one adjective to that sentence. They successfully survived. You know, it worked. They may have had a bruise, but they did. It got successful and they enjoy that new place a lot more. It, they did their research, found the right home for them. Every home is not a home for everybody. Every firm is not a firm for everybody, but they find the right one. It's a good match. Thanks everyone for listening. If you'd like to learn more about our experts and how Oyster can help you on your journey to starting your own investment advisor, visit our website at oysterllc.com. If you like what you heard today, follow us on whatever platform you listen to and give us a review. Reviews make it easier for people to find us. Have a great day.